uterine fibroids and fertility, what you should know. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor. And today I'm gonna to talk about uterine fibroids. Fibroids are also called myomas and they are very common. But first, if you want to support me as I help educate about your body and your fertility, please subscribe to the channel. That helps spread this message to more people. Uterine fibroids are really common. So fibroids occur in up to 70% of people with a uterus of reproductive age. What is a fibroid? A fibroid is a tumor, and I know that word tumor is really concerning, but a tumor is just an abnormal growth of cells. So fibroids are almost always benign, and they're an abnormal growth of cells, the same cell line as the uterus, the myometrium or the muscular component of the uterus. The symptoms of fibroids can vary, but pretty classically, fibroids cause heavy bleeding, painful periods. They can also cause what we call bulk symptoms, meaning there's a lot of pressure or discomfort in your abdomen. Fibroids themselves are typically not a cause of irregular periods, although they can be if they're on the inside of the uterus, they can sometimes cause spotting or abnormal bleeding. So the size and the location of a fibroid matters. When we look at this picture, we can see that fibroids are in so many different spots. So fibroids that are inside the uterus are called submucosal, they're inside the mucosa. Fibroids that are in the myometrium or the muscular component are intramural, and these fibroids can sometimes push or impact the uterine lining, or they may be completely separate from it. Fibroids in this area can also impact fallopian tubes or the cervix and make birth or getting pregnant more difficult. Fibroids can be on the outside of the uterus, and this can be called subserosal, or they could be pedunculated, which is hanging off the uterus or in the broad ligaments, which are really close to the uterus, but actually on the outside. We think that fibroids mostly can impact by anatomic distortion. So they change your normal anatomy. They can make it hard for egg and sperm to pass through the fallopian tube. They can make it hard for an embryo to implant inside the uterus, or they can make it hard for that placenta to grow in. So most studies have looked at fibroids in two different ways. One is, are they impacting your ability to get pregnant? And the other is, are they impacting your ability to stay pregnant? There has been one observational study, meaning you just observe people in nature who had fibroids to see if it made a difference in natural fertility rates. And in this study, the size or location did not make any difference on people being able to get pregnant. However, this was a pregnancy study, meaning they looked at people with the outcome of pregnancy. So if a fibroid caused infertility and prevented you from becoming pregnant, you would not have been included in the study population. So that's a pretty big limitation. There was one study looking at IVF studies showing a very small difference in implantation rate in women who had a small fibroid less than five centimeters of size versus people who had no fibroids. But further studies have shown that fibroids, if they are not distorting the inside of the cavity, do not impact clinical pregnancy rates. So what does that mean? When a fibroid is inside the muscle portion of the uterus, it might just completely not impact the inside of the uterine cavity. However, if it pushes and impacts the inside of the cavity, then what we see is that it can impact our pregnancy rates. So what this means is although the size of the fibroid is important, the location matters the most. So a fibroid of the same size that is remote from the uterine cavity probably has minimal impact, whereas even a smaller fibroid that's inside or protruding into the cavity could impact the ability of a placenta to implant. And I think that makes sense when we think about it. When looking at pregnancy loss, there was a large study with over 5,000 people in it with and without fibroids, looking at if they had a higher association of miscarriage if they had a fibroid, and no association was seen. However, smaller retrospective studies have suggested there may be an association. So this clinical question is probably really individualized on where the fibroid is located. And then a further question is, should you take out the fibroid? Does that improve fertility rates potentially? Definitely there are medical indications to remove a fibroid regardless of if you want fertility or not. Meaning if you have heavy bleeding called menorrhagia, if you are becoming anemic, if you need a blood transfusion, if you're bleeding through your clothes or your pain is so bad that you can't have your activities of daily living, these are indications alone for medical or surgical treatment of your fibroids. Definitive surgical treatment would be removing your uterus, but if you want future fertility, then sometimes we consider a myomectomy or a removal of the fibroid instead. Myomectomies can be done a variety of different ways, and the way is going to depend on the location and the size of the fibroid. So old school or original is gonna be complete open surgery with an incision like a C-section where you go in and you take the fibroid out. And you can get a really nice repair of the uterus and you have really great visualization, but that's a much longer recovery. 
Other ways can include robotic or laparoscopic. That's a minimally invasive procedure, which is shown to be equal in outcomes and patients have faster recovery. So that's more standard of care for most fibroids right now, although it would depend on the size and the clinical characteristics. There's also hysteroscopic, which is resection through the vagina. So this is where you use a little camera and instruments to remove the fibroid vaginally from the inside of the uterus. And this is how submucosal or fibroids inside the uterus should be taken out. There's been only one randomized controlled trial looking at people with infertility who had fibroids or not to see if surgical removal made a difference. In this study, women had infertility for at least a year and they had one single solitary fibroid of less than four centimeters in size. They were encouraged to have timed intercourse after surgery in order to report pregnancy outcomes. There was no improvement in pregnancy rates for people who underwent surgery if their fibroids were subserosal or intramural, so on the middle or on the outside of the uterus. However, for people who had submucosal or those fibroids inside the uterine cavity, there was a doubling in the probability of getting pregnant, so a significant improvement. And this has led to our current standard of care where we definitely want to remove fibroids that are on the inside of the cavity, but potentially not for those that are on the outside or the intramural area. There have been some studies done in a different patient population with fibroids and recurrent pregnancy loss, so two or more miscarriages. And in one of these studies, there was a benefit to fibroid removal in continuing a further pregnancy. So your clinical history may play a role on what you decide to do when it comes to surgery or not. And when it comes to looking at IVF pregnancies, we've seen that removal of some fibroids that are five centimeters or bigger, even if they do not impact the cavity, potentially could have a benefit for some people. So when we take all this information together, fibroids definitely can have a huge impact on your life. They are common and there are medical treatments, but those are all contradicting if you want to be pregnant because they're hormonal. Their job is to decrease the fibroid or the bleeding, and that usually is going to make it impossible for you to get pregnant. Now, when you evaluate if you should have surgery or not, surgical recovery from a fibroid that is in the muscle component of the uterus, an intramuscular fibroid, an intramural one, can have a really significant recovery. Sometimes you need at least six months to recover before you could get pregnant, and you do carry a risk of uterine rupture upon pregnancy in the future. So just getting surgery is not a benign thing, and so we don't just put everybody through surgery. And obviously, each surgery has risks. I always say you only have one uterus, you need to treat it kindly and be mindful about what is going on. And I have seen patients who've had fibroids removed and then had scar tissue inside their uterus or part of their uterus closed up at the time of surgery. So we have to be really mindful that we think we're doing good. So the take home message is that if you have a uterine fibroid, they're really common. Most fibroids we actually ignore. So the vast majority of them I do not remove anymore. I do remove submucosal fibroids. So ones that are inside the mucosa or inside that uterine cavity, that definitely can impact implantation and surgery is much more minimally invasive and carries fewer risks. I do recommend surgical removal for those. Intramural fibroids that are pushing and protruding into the cavity, I give a strong consideration to removing them, especially if we have context of prior pregnancy loss really large intramural fibroids otherwise, we kind of see what the clinical history is. Very often, we will consider getting embryos, trying to get pregnant, and potentially if we need to have a myomectomy, making sure that we've preserved our fertility so that we don't lose that option as we're letting our uterus recover. And this is consistent with recommendations from ASRM, which is this, in asymptomatic women with cavity distorting myomas, intramural with a submucosal component or submucosal, myomectomy, which is can be open, laparoscopic, or hysteroscopic, may be considered to improve pregnancy rates. Myomectomy is generally not advised to improve pregnancy outcomes in asymptomatic and fertile women with non-cavity distorting myomas. However, myomectomy may be reasonable in some circumstances, including but not limiting severe distortion of pelvic architecture, complicating access to ovaries for egg retrieval, which would be with IVF. I hope this helped a little bit trying to understand why some fibroids matter for fertility and some do not. Admittedly, there is a lack of studies here. There's definitely more research that needs to be done to fully understand fibroids and understand our treatment options, especially since they are so common. If you have fibroids, know that you're not alone and please make sure you seek help so you know what all of your options are. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or hear more on the As a Woman podcast. Subscribe to the channel. Thanks, friends.